Good morning, everybody. It's good to see your smiling faces, and welcome to those who are watching online around the country and around the world. Thanks, everybody, for being part of this amazing Crossroads family. And uh, I do want to say, I can't wait to see Marzea this, uh, this week. Not only is she going to be here on Friday, she's also going to be uh, speaking on Sunday morning. Uh, this is something incredible to me because I remember when my girls were growing up for, uh, for a whole season, we would, we would read a story about some amazing uh, man or woman of, of faith uh, that, that's either lived or living now, that's just God uh, has done some amazing things in and through and just their, their faith through difficult times. And we got a chance to have one of those in our church this, uh, this coming Friday and this coming Sunday, so I can't wait to, to meet her and hear her, her story in person. Uh, and, and something else too, do want to say that we're going to have the Taste of Crossroads luncheon right after this service. If you've just been coming a little while or if you've been here a while and you just want to say, okay, what's the next step? And you want to meet some amazing people and I get to know you a little, a little bit better, you get to know me a little bit better, uh, there's going to be there and a free lunch. You can't beat that, right? I want to say just uh, congratulations to, to everybody in here. That We had a unanimous vote of over 170 people. I mean, when does that ever Ever, ever happen. Can we give God glory for that? If we took a vote, we'd never say, you know, come unanimous on, on whether I'm wearing blue pants or not, right? I mean, we just live in a world like that. But so it just says an awful lot about the, uh, about the unity of this church, and I praise God uh, for that. And we pray God continues to, to have us so amazingly united. You know, uh, this is a difficult message that I'm going to give to, uh, today to, to share because this is something that we've all faced, and it's a difficult part of our faith journey. It's a difficult part of, uh, of us being a part of this, uh, this broken world, and that's that there's times that we pray for people, and we don't see what we wish we would see. We pray for people, and not only do they, they not get better, they get worse, and sometimes we've all prayed for people and not only have they, uh, have they not gotten better, they've died. And so what do we do with, uh, with that? Because here's the thing, we've been looking at this today, we end a series that we've been looking at on, on Healer. And we've said that God loves to heal, it's in his heart to heal. He says, beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in good health, even as your soul prospers. Jesus said, when you, when you see me, you've seen the Father, and Jesus spent so much time healing, so it shows the Father's heart that he loves to do that. We also saw that God loves to heal through human beings. God loves to heal through people, that just like he encourages through human beings usually, and provides usually through human beings, he usually heals through a human, human being, through somebody's either... You know, all healing comes from God, either medicine, things, but also through the healing prayers of God's, of God's people as, uh, as well. But if you look in the Bible, not everybody got healed. And there was a friend of Paul's. Now, remember, Paul was this incredible, amazing man of faith that even uh, that healed the sick, but also even raised the dead, for heaven's sakes. That's an man, amazing man of faith. But we read in, in one part in 2 Timothy that he says this, Erastus stayed in, stayed in Corinth, uh, and I left Trophimus sick in Miletus. And, and I mean, wait a second. He's your friend. He's your coworker, and you left him sick. So apparently... The prayers didn't work for one of his, his friends, even though he saw so many people healed. And we saw last week that there was uh, the disciples, while Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, along with three other disciples, the nine disciples down here, somebody brought their, uh, their son who was sick and, and struggling with demonic stuff, and, and they couldn't heal him. And Jesus had to come and heal them, but they came. Now, remember, Jesus had given them power and authority, and they saw, they saw not only Jesus healed, but they saw many, many, many people through, healed through them, and, and yet this wasn't happening this time. And they asked the question, they asked the question, why? Why this time did it not happen, Jesus? And that's a question that probably every single one of us, if we're honest, those watching online, those in the house, have asked from time to time. We've asked the question of, okay, God, why when we prayed for this person, the, the same people, that they got better, and the very same people prayed for the very same situation in this person, and they didn't get better? God, why? And maybe, God, why don't you, why don't you heal everybody every time we pray? God, Why? And I've asked that question of why. There was a time when I was in second grade, my, um, 
My mom had, had colon cancer and it metastasized into liver cancer and also bone cancer. And she was only supposed to live a couple of months. Well, my mom ended up living 14 years with all that things. She asked, uh, you know, she said, I prayed, she said that she prayed for her to be able to see her kids grow. And I said, mom, you should have prayed for your great, great grandkids to see, to see them. But I mean, this is a miracle, especially in the day for all that stuff that she had. Her, uh, her doctor, her Jewish doctor, uh, who was uh, non-religious, just goes, man, I have no answer to this. This is just, but keep praying. There were other times that one time my, my mom confided in me that for three years she had had diarrhea every single day. And, uh, and I said, Mom, why didn't you tell us? Why didn't you tell me this? And let's pray. And we prayed right then. And that moment, I mean, she did not have it again that I know of for a, for a season in her life. In fact, a week later, she was constipated. Oh, man, that's, that's, <laughs> that's when God says he can do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. There's an example of that, right? I mean, but, you know, so we see this, and I'll tell you another miracle. That One time that my dad called me up, and he said, your mom's dying, and she's gonna, supposed to die tonight. And I've, I've, uh, I was in, in college, and, and she said, he said, uh, I put you on my, the first flight out. And I got there, and I've been a pastor for many years. I've, I've been with people, many, many people, as they were dying. My mom was about to die. I mean, she was, she was on death's door. And I remember, and I was praying for her, my, the, the college was praying for her and everything, and I remember this, I, I remember that, uh, that my pastor at that time got us all together in a room, my brother, my, my dad, and, my, uh, and also my uncles and aunts that were all gathered there, and he said this, he said, we believe there's someone here who can't face death. And they all turned and looked at me. And I realized, wait, this isn't a time where we're praying for healing for her. This is an intervention, and I'm the one they're intervening, you know? That's, and so, uh, so I, I, I said this. I actually started to laugh, and I said, I, said I, I can face death, but whether she dies in 30 seconds or 30 years, I'm still going to pray, and I'm still going to believe. And the thing that's amazing with that is my mom two weeks later was out of the hospital and baking me cookies and sending them to me in, in college. It was absolutely a miracle of God. But amen, let's man, I'll tell you. But here's the thing that's wild. My mom still died and my mom still died of cancer. And here's the thing that I, you know, that I ask is, is, God, why? I mean, why? You can do all this. Obviously, you can heal. Obviously, you can do this. Why, why not just complete what you've done so many, many times and, and done this incredible thing? And sometimes, let's just be honest, sometimes we ask why and we don't have some, uh, some answers. So here's some things just to, get, to go about. Uh, some things to consider. First of all, not everyone around Jesus was healed or risen from the dead. I mean, Jesus, every time he, that we have record of him ever showing up to a funeral, he turned into a welcome home party. But that does not mean he did not walk through the graveyard and everybody come bopping out when he, when he did that. It didn't happen. There were still some people in Judea. There were still some people in Galilee. There were still some people in Jerusalem that were not healed as Jesus walked this, this planet. Another thing is, is this. Every person ever, even every healed person, ultimately dies. There's, uh, I, I heard the song yesterday, Turn, Turn, Turn by the Birds, written in 1965, that is a direct quote, almost all of it, from Ecclesiastes chapter three in the Bible. And it says, to everything, there is a, there's a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to what? A time to die, wait, a time to die. So that means, that means there is a time for every single one of us that sometimes the prayer is not going to be answered. Now, I remember talking to a young lady, uh, and uh, she had, hadn't come to the church for a while. I said, hey, we missed you. How are you doing? And she goes, well, to be honest, I'm mad at God. And I said, why are you mad at God? And she said, because I prayed for my Mima to be healed, and she, and she died. And I said, how old was your, your Mima? And she said, 83. And I said, I, seriously, I'm very, very sorry that you, you lost your Mima. That's, that's, a, that's a tough thing. But can I just, can I be real with you? And she said, sure. And I said, I said, think of this. Can we maybe even look at that a different way and say, 
God gave your Mima 83 incredible years, a long life on this earth. And you had all that time to the time you've been born to now to, for your, with your Mima. I said, my, my grandparents died before I was born. I would have loved to have a Mima for a little while. And you know what God did for your Mima? God died for your Mima so she could have eternal life, so she could be in heaven right, right, right now. Can we maybe look at it a different way? And she was, she was at church the next, the next Sunday. But here's something, too, that I, that I, th- I think of is, is also everyone Jesus ever healed eventually died, right? I mean, think of it. Even the people Jesus raised from the dead, the, the, the widow of Nain's son and Jairus' daughter and Lazarus, they eventually died. How do I know that? Because there are no 2,000-year-old people be bopping around in this world right now, Right? Everybody eventually, you know what that means? That means that, that even though God loves to heal and is awesome at healing and, every, and everything, that there comes the time where, where we just say, this is not our home. I mean, we realize that, right? We're just passing through here for 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years, whatever it is. This is not our home. I love what, uh, what uh, Lenny says from time to time. He says this, we are, we are not uh, human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings that are having a human experience for a little while. Paul called this a tent, and he said there's gonna come a time where we put down that tent so we can live in, the, in the, the, the forever home that God made for us. And that means that every time that's eventually, every person that ever prays for you and every person that you ever pray for eventually will go home to, to, to be with God if they're, a, if they're a Christian. So eventually, God will say, no, I'm sorry, this time, this time, I'm taking them home. And so uh, an, another thing is this, ask the question is, is where does uh, sickness come from then? Where does sickness disease, why is there that in this world if we have a God who loves to, to heal? Well, first of all, God didn't make it this way. This is uh, as a result of the fall of, of man. You took a look in the Garden of Eden, there was no sin, there was no sickness, there was no disease, there was no infirmity, there was no heartache, there was no earthquakes, there were no mean dogs, there were no anything like this, right? Nothing like that. Everything was incredible, but, but when, when Adam and Eve sinned, it didn't just affect their life, it affected every single one of our life, and it came down, and it affected all of nature and all of creation as well. A way I could think of describing that is one time I remember that I was, I was riding a, a riding lawnmower at my first church. They had one in the parsonage, and, and all of a sudden, uh, I saw, I heard thunk, and I saw this, this, this rock just head out straight towards my car. And it was like, you know, it was just that moment. It was like slow motion. That's how long it took to do there. And I wanted to go, no, you know, and grab the thing. But it was like, so it hit the back windshield of the car. And it didn't just make a hole, right? It just went kink, 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 but so, and that's what happened with, you know, with, when, when we blew it, is, is it didn't just affect us, it affected everything, just like that didn't just affect that, not, that little hole, it affected the whole windshield. Now, here's the great news. There will come a time where God will put everything back into order, right? But until that time, we live in a broken world, and there's disease, and there's sickness, and there's problem, and there's heartache, and there's all that in this broken, broken world. Now, uh, Jesus uh, attributed some uh, sickness to the demonic. Now, he attributed all sickness and problems and pain and suffering back eventually to Satan. He said, it's the thief that comes to kill, steal, and destroy. I've come so you might have life and have it abundantly. But Jesus sometimes uh, pointed it directly back to, to demonic or satanic activity. An example of that was one time there was a lady with, uh, that had been crippled for 18 years. And listen to what Jesus said. He said, then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom, who it is it? Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be free, set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her. And you think about that is, is, you know, he's saying in this case, not in all cases, but in this particular case, there's been a satanic attack on this woman's health. And so, and that's one of the reasons we, we get sick sometimes. Another is some sickness can be related to sin. There was a man at the pool of Bethesda, and, uh, and G, he'd been an invalid for 38 years, and Jesus healed him, and then look what happened when Jesus saw him again. He said, later Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, see you are well again, don't miss this, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. 
Now, in, in, uh, I had a friend who, who had a heart attack in his 30s because he heavily abused drugs in his, in his 20s. I have a friend who's, uh, who had a heart attack at 50 because he, he smoked for, 30, for 34 years. I have, uh, how about this? There are 19 million new cases of sexually transmitted diseases in the United States, half of which are between, people between the ages of 15 and 24. Did God cause that? No, choices caused all those things, didn't it? Sometimes our choices can cause pain and suffering and even disease in this, uh, in this world. Another thing is that uh, God also makes it very clear that a lot of sin has nothing to do with personal sin whatsoever. In fact, there's this incredible story in the middle, just about smack dab in the middle of the Bible. It's the book of Job, and there's a guy named Job. He went through absolute hell, physically, emotionally, everything. I mean, this guy went through horrible, terrible times. And here's the wild thing is God says, makes it clear, he did nothing wrong. In fact, God goes out of his way to say, there's no one like this guy. This, that man, Job, he loves me more than anybody else on the face of this planet. That guy, Job, he's, he follows me closer than anybody else on this planet, and yet all this happened to, to him. He did nothing wrong. In fact, his friends came up and said, well, obviously you're doing something wrong because otherwise you wouldn't be sick. You wouldn't be having this problem. So obviously there's some sin in your life that you need to repent of. And you know what? God, at the end of the story, he basically says to those, those guys, the friends, shut up. You have no idea what you're talking about. You have no idea what you're talking about. That sometimes it just happens because, again, we live in a broken world. And look at this. In Jesus' day, people believed that, that if somebody was sick, somebody sinned somewhere. And look at the disciples at this. As they went along, he saw a man, born, a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents, that he was born blind. In their mind, it had to be somebody. It had to be either him or his parents. Somebody sinned. And look what Jesus said. He said, neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. Jesus dismissed the common opinion of his day that saying sin was always a result of, of some, or sickness was a result of some sin. In fact, the way I read the Gospels, Jesus seemed to go out of his way to show God especially cares for the broken and especially cares for the hurting and especially care for the sick, right? And, and here's the, the, the truth is faith is extremely important when it comes to, to healing and things. That's a biblical fact. Give a couple of, uh, and many times Jesus attributed healing to the, the person's faith, an example of that would be the woman with the issue of blood. She said, if I can just reach out and touch his cloak, I'm going to be, be healed. And, and she was healed. And Jesus looked and said, said, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Bartimaeus, that we took to look at last week, cried out, Jesus, have mercy on me, son of David. And, uh, and, and he was healed. And look what Jesus said. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the way. Jesus, time and time, the Bible time and time again says there is a correlation between how much faith we have and the miraculous in our life. How much faith we have and the healing that we see around as we... As, as we pray. Other times, Jesus attributed healing not to the person, but to the faith community around the person. An example of that would be the, uh, the paralytic that his friends brought him to Jesus. They couldn't get in the house. They climbed up on the roof. They tore a hole in the roof. They, uh, they, they lowered him down. And Jesus, the Bible says, saw their faith, not his faith, their faith. It was those guys' faith that brought him down there. That he, that's, what, that's what turned the heart of, of Jesus the, at that moment. And, here, and I love that because here's the thing. Sometimes it is hard to muster enough faith, isn't it? There are times where it just seems like we're, 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 we're so sick or it's been so long and everything, and we just go, God, I don't even know if I have the strength to pray for myself anymore. And that's why I think it's so important to have the body of Christ and, and even somebody just a, just a few minutes ago, amen. And I, there's so much power when we pray together too. Jesus said these words. He said, again, I tell you the truth, that if two of you agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. 
I love that, that, man, that's why we have a, have a prayer team. That's why we pray for each other. I love to see somebody saying something, all of a sudden you see people laying their hands on, on them in the middle of, in the middle of you know, after service and things. Because why? There's something, there's, there's, faith, there's strength, there's healing in the, in the community. I love being, being part of a, a church that believes in healing. And he says this, but also lack of, oh, there's sometimes there's, there's, well, there was no faith apparent whatsoever. Remember the story where, where the, uh, Jesus has just been betrayed by Judas and all of a sudden these people are coming to, to arrest him and Peter starts playing samurai disciple, right? He gets his sword out and he, and he cuts the, the, the servant of the high priest's ear off. Now to make no mistake, he missed. He wasn't going for the ear. He was going for the head. He was trying to lop off his head. He missed. And then here's the part that gets me is Peter cuts off a guy's ear and then asks Jesus if he should use the sword. How many of you know that if the guy's ear is laying on the ground, it's a little too late to ask the question, right? And, but here's the thing, that, that nobody we see in that whole story had, you know, showed faith. Nobody asked for a healing. Jesus just out of the blue heals. And I'm glad that God does that sometimes. He just heals because he just loves. And nobody's maybe said anything, done anything. He just loves to, loves to heal. But here's another lack of faith kept people from being healed in, in the Bible time and time again. But look at this, that sometime there was a, in, in, in one chapter, here's what we see. We see Jesus calming a storm. Then we see Jesus the, uh, going in and setting the, peril, uh, the, the demoniac free. Then we see him healing the woman with the issue of blood. And then we see him raising Jairus' daughter. And then only moments later, he goes just a couple of miles uh, away as the crow flies. And he goes to Capernaum, his hometown. And people don't have enough faith. And watch, ha- watch what happens. He, talking about Jesus, could could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. When there was an environment of unbelief, even, even Jesus struggled to heal. And there again, a direct correlation between faith and healing. And this is, uh, again, in third world countries, one thing you see, uh, you see way more miraculous healings. Thank God we have medicine here and we see a lot of healing through medicine and things like that in the United States. But you go to third world countries, they don't have that, but you see a lot of miraculous supernatural healings. Why there? Does God love them more than he loves us? Of course not. I think it's because, man, they have faith. I mean, I've been there. I've prayed. I've prayed for these people time and time again. And they would be shocked if something didn't happen. And if we can just be real that, that far too often, we'd be shocked if something did happen if, uh, if, you know, as we pray for people. But then here's the, a big question. Does that mean if a person stays sick, they don't have enough faith? That's what some, some well-meaning people told my mom one time. They just said, if you had enough faith, then you'd be healed. And I looked at him and said, do you pray for my mom? I said, sure, of course I do. Well, then how come your faith hasn't healed her? Maybe you don't have enough of faith. That's a, that's a heavy load to put on somebody, saying if you just had enough faith. And it, because here's the thing, too. We don't see that in the Bible. Of course, we see, I said, we see a correlation. But sometimes we don't, okay? Sometimes we don't. Because, because Paul, again, he has all the faith in the world. There's barely ever been a person that walked this planet that had more faith than this man. When you see people raised from the dead, you've got some faith. But at the same time, we just talked about one of his friends that wasn't healed. There's another one. His protege, who was Timothy, was uh, the, uh, uh, it says this in the Bible. Paul says, drink some wine. Don't just drink water because of all your ailments and because of your stomach problem that you have. And apparently, again, here's his friend that's having stomach problems that obviously he's prayed for that wasn't healed, that's still struggling with things. In Paul's own life, we saw miracle after miracle. One time he is grabbing some some wood and a viper goes and, and, and bites him there and everybody's expecting him to get sick and die right there on the spot. He has no sign of any problem whatsoever. This same guy though, listen to what happens. He says this, to keep me, this is Paul talking, from being conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there has been given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, 
whew, there it is again, who to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away uh, from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardship, in persecution, in difficulties. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. And here Paul has something of the, that he calls a, a thorn in the flesh. We don't know what it is, but we do know he prayed for it and three times. And, and God said, no, I'm not gonna heal that, but here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna give you all the grace that you need to make it through that. And something, that, there's things that have called me to scratch my head and say why. There's a man by the name of John Wimber that, uh, that died in the last few years. And John was somebody who truly had a gift of healing. And I mean a gift of healing. There's, we read in the Bible that there are spiritual gifts, supernatural gifts. That uh, there's uh, teaching, leadership, mercy, giving, things like this. There's people that are called evangelism, things like that. And there's some people that it says uh, several times that have a gift of healing. He was one of the people that had that. I remember one time he came to our, to our school and he comes up and he's the hum- most humble guy ever. He looked like, looked like Santa too. And he comes up there and he says, uh, you know, I'm just gonna teach you some things maybe to help, pray, help you pray to, uh, for healing for people. And he goes, there, and he, to tell you what he's like, he goes, there's 53 people here who have, uh, who have insomnia. So if you have insomnia, come on the stage. And these are my friends. They haven't been set up in any way. And all of a sudden, there's this group of people, and he counts, and there's 53 people, and we're going, whoa. And then he goes, now, most people, he goes, I don't know what I'm doing. But he said, I'm just trying to figure this out, just like you are. But he said, most people would just start here and just start praying for people. But look at this one young lady here. Happened to be a young lady in my, uh, on my sister wing. He said, look at this, look at, look at her, the Holy Spirit's all over her. He said, she's glowing, she's got, the, you know, her eyelids are, are, are kind of twitching. And so I'm just gonna figure, I'm gonna start where God's already, already working. What a good thing there. But I remember that many, many times God has healed me through a process. And he, sometimes just through prayer, through a process. Sometimes through, through medicine, through a process, whatever it is. But there have been times in my life that God has instantaneously healed me. And I give glory to God for that. And I want to say that. That's actually happened many times in my life. But here's something. One of the times I was coming back from my first mission trip uh, from Singapore. And, and the second I hit the plane, I, I got a 102, 103 fever or above for I think it was 10 days that I had it. Maybe even more long than that. And so uh, they thought I either had malaria or hepatitis. What I think it was is my body just said, we're done. Because they had me on a schedule that was insane for nine weeks, that sometimes I'd be preaching four times in 24 hours in two different countries. And I, and I think my body said, okay, it's, uh, okay, you can collapse now. And so, but so, I, man, I was, I was emotionally drained. I had nothing to give. I was spiritually drained. I'd just been given and given and given and not had anything coming in. I was so tired and I was so sick. And I remember going to, to uh, John Wimber's church and he wasn't even there that day, but I still remember somebody just stood up and he said, Holy Spirit, come. Just gave that invitation. And man, God, oh, uh, uh, he, he went in that invitation. And I mean, for about 40 minutes, I experienced the power of God in such a strong, incredible way. And man, I was healed from that moment on. Emotionally, spiritually, it just pour, poured back into me. I was a changed person. Here's the thing that's weird to me is that John Wimmer, that same person who had this gift of healing, also had heart problems, okay? He would for, prayed for so many people with heart problems that got, that got healed. He also died of cancer. And so it's kind of weird. There was a guy named, by the name of Eric that I know that Eric had, the, again, a, a, a healing. Just he, he prayed for people, and they got better. And one of the things that he had was, was praying for deaf people. And I mean, straight out of the Bible, deaf people that were able to, that were able to, to hear. And here's the thing that was, that was wild in that is that, uh, that he's deaf, and yet God used him in such a strong way to do that. But here's the thing that I love, is neither John Wimber or Eric or, or Paul ever stopped praying, even though, because they saw too much. They saw, they saw it happen too much to not believe when it didn't happen. They'd seen the power of God. They'd known the power of God, and just because it didn't happen sometime, they never, ever stopped praying, and they never stopped believing even for their own miracle. And we had a, a dear, dear friend and brother that about 16 months ago went to be with the Lord, and uh, Walter Charles, and here's a testimony shortly before he died.
When the doctor tells you that you can't do surgery because of the spread of the cancer and the chemo that you'll be using, that it's not curative, that it's not a cure for your situation. And even when the geneticist says, hey, this is random, this isn't from an inherited thing that's been passed along from family, it's not environmental, it's random, you find yourself in a situation where you can only recognize that the, the solution to this, the answer to this, is only through God the Father. God has shown up on my behalf in so many ways, uh, financially, in relationships, with regard to dreams and hopes and aspirations, simply answering certain prayers. Uh, and, and so I think that has been a good nurture for me to be in a place that I have to step up. Uh, when I identify myself as a follower of Christ, a disciple of Christ, a Christian, uh, I don't have any other choice than to believe in the promises of the Father, to, to believe in the scriptures, to believe that the one who says he's with me to the end of the age is with me now. When tidbits of your life start to look like bits of Bible stories or the testimonies of those who have come before you, you have no choice other than to walk in the belief and the confidence that one, God is sovereign, that you are His and He is yours, and that His promises for you are true. By His stripes, you are healed. It's His desire that you would prosper in health in all things as your soul prospers. It's His desire and it's His promise that if you ask, seek, and knock, uh, He will answer that if you uh, delight yourself in Him, He would give you the desires of your heart. And so when you begin to think about your relationship with the Christ and the study and the believing and your immersion in that relationship with Him, you don't have the choice to look left or right, but only to look straight ahead and to trust that He is the God of your healing. For me, this it's, it's a cancer journey right now, uh, but I am fully believing uh, that in the face of being told I'm going to be using chemo uh, all of my life, being told that the chemo isn't curative, it's just something that sustains or controls. Um, in order to have a full and abundant life, uh, it's, it's going to come through the Christ, through God the Father. That's my absolute belief. And so I encourage others, whatever your circumstance, whatever the thing is that you're walking through, especially if you call yourself Christian, you get in the flow, see the opportunity that's in front of you, you know, kiss this wave, so to speak, see this challenge that's in front of you through the eyes, through the lens of your relationship with the one who is sovereign and absolutely in control. And I think in that I've found a bit of peace. I can focus on the work he's called me to. I can focus on family and friends and living this full life experience, believing that he's handling the peripheral issue that is this cancer. He is the one who defines my identity. And if my identity is as his, then again, I have no other choice than to believe in him. And so I encourage uh, any believer, stand steadfast in those belief, in those promises. I encourage anyone who has not yet tasted and seen just how good the Christ is, uh, to bring him your circumstance and see how it's his desire to love you through it. And uh, it will change your life and your perspective forever. This is the wave that I'm kissing right now, and I'll stand on his promises. I'll believe in his promises. And I look forward to the celebration when I can say to the congregation and all of you who have been praying for me and with me and supporting me, hey, it is finished, the Father has moved, let's get on with the next thing. I miss my brother and my friend a lot. Here's what I can say is he, he never lost faith in what God could do. And even though it, towards the end of his life, you know, he's always continually praying for other people. And I know that because I was, I was there for a lot of that. I was there when he gave his, his last breath. And I, I'll, I'll say something, is, is he never got lost faith in God? He never said, well, here, I'll pray for you, but it doesn't work. Uh, just because he wasn't seeing at that time in his life, he'd seen so much in his life that he still believed, that he still prayed and did that. I love something that he said, that I look forward to the day when we can celebrate with him that it is finished, the Father has moved, 
Let's get on with the, the next thing. And you know, for, for him, you guys, it's finished. For my mom, it's finished. I love this. That we serve a God that, that it, it, it didn't happen the way I wanted it to. It didn't happen the way we wanted it to. But it happened. He's totally, completely, forever healed. Not just for a moment on this earth. Amen. Is that not? And here's some of the greatest news you will ever hear. For the Christian, he always heals. Sometimes here and sometimes in the resurrection. But there will always be a time. And when it happens here, it's just for a little while. When it happens there, it's forever. That, that we, there will be a time we will, will never have pain again. We will never have sorrow again. We will never have a broken heart again. We will never have any issue, any of those things ever, ever again. That's for the, for the Christian. So we can trust in God. And here's the thing. I don't have all the answers. I don't. I never will. I, I, I struggle with things just like you. But here's the things I know that I know that I, that I know is first of all that the God's ways are not our ways. He says this, as the, as, as the, just, my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways. As the heavens are above the earth, think about how high that is, so are my thoughts above your thoughts, and my ways above your ways. Here's the thing, God's ways are never, ever wrong, ever. Our ways are usually, or oftentimes, wrong. And God's, God's ways, and that doesn't mean we're going to understand them all. Because we're not. We're not going to understand this God that's, that's so, so amazing. But here's the, what the Bible says. To trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not to your own understanding. Because that, you know what that is? We don't have to figure it out because he already has it figured out. And the other thing is this. That God is good. That's the other thing. I know that God is good. He doesn't just do some good things. He is good. He, and you know what that means? He can never, ever do anything that's not good. Nothing that he will ever do, has ever done, or ever will do is not good at its, at, it, at its core. And the other thing is, is, is this, that God loves you, and he loves your loved one more than you do. Remember, there's a time that um, when I was, when my mom was, was struggling with cancer towards the very end, and I remember being woken up in the middle of the night with a scream that did not sound human. And I remember going into the, the restroom as my mom was crumpled on the, on the floor. And I, I bent down and I, I, I picked her up in my arms and she was so hurt from because of the cancer in her bones. And I, and I remember looking up and I didn't, I didn't scream this out loud, but I screamed it as loud as I could humanly say it inside my heart and in my mind. I said, God, where are you? And maybe you've, you've asked that same question from time to time. God, where are you? And I'll never forget, I got the answer again. It was not audible, but it was screaming in my life. It was spoken nicely, but it was loud. And he said, I'm right here, and I love your mom more than you do. And something changed in my life right there as I was praying for my mom and realized, man, God, uh, yeah. I mean, she, if, my, if my love for my mom's a little thimble, God's love for my mom was an entire ocean. And I can never understand. But at that moment, I can go, God, even when I don't understand, I can, I can trust you. Because there's something else. Not only does God, God love your loved one more than you do, God has more invested in your loved one more than you do. You didn't create your loved one, right? You didn't create your, your loved one. God, God did. And, and, and you didn't die for your loved one. God did. But here's the great thing, is that God for those of us who are Christ Jesus, he did everything he could to provide a way where this will not always be like this, that there is a heaven, that there is complete and total, a new body, a new restoration with no disease, no struggle, no anything like that. So until that time, amen. So until that time, we may not have all the answers. We trust in the one who does. And we keep praying and we keep believing because I believe in prayer. I've seen it happen too many times. I've seen God do miracles. I believe in miracles. I don't understand why they don't happen all the time, but I'm gonna trust in the one who is always good, who always has our best interests in mind and who loves us and our loved one more than we love them.